The Yale School of Medicine uh, kindly uh, loaned uh, this uh, 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 auditorium to the Yale School of Public Health for our event uh, with Governor Ned Lamont and Mayor Justin Elliker. Um, I, it's my pleasure as Dean of the School of Public Health, my name is Sten Vermont, to introduce the president of our university. Uh, Peter Salovey is the 23rd president in Yale's history. And uh, although his primary appointment is in psychology, we're very proud to call him a Yale School of Public Health uh, faculty member because he has a secondary appointment for many, many years in our school as well. Not only that, but the first lady of Yale, uh, Marta Moret, uh, is a graduate of our school. So we feel we have an in in the president's office, although that's just sort of a feeling, not a reality, uh, because the president serves the entire university. So on that note, Peter, uh, we are going to turn it over to you for your greeting and introduction of our panelists today. Well, thank you, Dan. It's uh, uh, great to see uh, our panelists. And uh, I know many of you are watching on uh, Zoom or YouTube. And uh, Marta, who you just mentioned, uh, is one of them. Uh, she and I are very proud of our associations with the uh, Yale School of Public Health. To all the uh, School of Public Health students, uh, welcome to a new and uh, certainly extraordinary uh, academic year. I'm just so grateful that we can pursue with you uh, our mission of education, of research, of practice. Uh, we're doing that uh, partly in person and, and, and mostly remotely, but um, uh, I'm glad we are all now into the semester. And the reason why we can be uh, um, uh, so uh, aggressive in pursuing uh, education and research in this challenging time is because of the strong leadership of Governor Ned Lamont and Mayor Justin Elker. Uh, the um, support and open communication between their teams uh, and experts working at Yale, uh, in New Haven, across the state, has been phenomenal, and uh, I am just so, so grateful to the two of them and to everyone else who has been uh, making it possible to keep our campus, our city, and our region, and our state uh, safe. All of uh, that good work includes exemplary, uh, an exemplary report and, and wonderful ongoing work uh, from the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Group. And that work has benefited from contributions by members of the Yale community, some of whom are with us uh, today. We've been able together to significantly reduce communal transmission of COVID-19 since the peak in April. And as we work and as we study together this semester, we know that we share a responsibility to maintain and encourage uh, what is a positive health, uh, positive public health situation, relatively speaking, in our state. So today you will be hearing from the leaders who have contributed immeasurably to the health improvements in our region and in our state, and it is my honor to introduce them to you. Governor Ned Lamont has served communities in Connecticut as a business founder and as a volunteer teacher and through multiple roles in public service. He became the 89th governor of the state of Connecticut in 2019. Mayor Justin Elliker grew up in this state and earned his MBA uh, from the Yale School of Management and a master's in environmental management from the Yale School of the Environment. After years of working in public service, he was sworn in as the 51st mayor of New Haven at the beginning of this year. Albert Cohn is a co-chair of the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Group, and he is the chair of the Department of Epidemiology uh, of Microbial Diseases and a professor of epidemiology and of medicine. Indra Nui is co-chair of the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Group uh, uh, board co-chair of Advanced Connecticut and former CEO of PepsiCo. She earned her master's degree from the Yale School of Management and has served as a Yale trustee. 
Maritza Bahn is the Director of Health for the City of New Haven. She served and led in the public health sector for over 18 years. Thank you all for being with us today. And it is my pleasure to now turn things over to Mayor Elliker uh, to speak. Thank you all for being here. And thank you panelists especially. Thank you, uh, uh, Peter, for those kind opening remarks. Um, and uh, I, I obviously thank you to so many of the people on the stage for the work that you've been doing to help support uh, all of our residents around the state in, in New Haven uh, to keep us healthy. Uh, we've been doing pretty well. We've been doing pretty well, and that's um, uh, in large part uh, because we've been clear on um, following the science, following the research, and uh, our residents uh, around the state have overwhelmingly been uh, cooperating in mass wearing, social distancing, and following the so many uh, guidelines. And when you think about the importance of uh, the many students that um, are part of the Yale School of Public Health and uh, the many new students and the journey you're going to be embarking on, uh, now is a time more than ever when uh, your goals, your passions, your mission uh, it, it is underscored, the importance of it is underscored in the kind of impact that you can have on the health and well being of everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that has not been lost on you as uh, you have experienced in so many ways, I'm sure around the US and around the world uh, with this pandemic. But um, I, I want to encourage you, and I presume that many of you, uh, particularly those students that are in the Yale School of Public Health, are interested in the public service component of this. But the public service component of your, um, your education while you are here and beyond that is vital to uh, keeping people alive. And especially in these times when we look at the inequities that have been so rawly exposed by COVID-19 uh, and that have been highlighted even more by the protests around the nation. I urge you uh, to think deeply about your role in addressing those inequities. Uh, it's, there's exciting possibilities, but it's also critical that we push ourselves to think out of the box, to be open to criticism, and to think deeply about how our personal roles and the organizations we represent can play a, a sig have a significant impact on addressing so many inequalities that exist. Uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be here. And Stan, am I supposed to turn it over to the governor now? Governor, thanks. That's right. Governor Lamont. Well, good morning. And um, Peter, I like that halo-like rainbow in your background. That's a divine. It gives us a little bit of hope. And uh, Justin, thank you. As um, Justin said, um, we're following the science, but it's not without irony that um, Indra, Justin, and I all graduated from Yale School of Management. Josh Jabal, who's here with us, who helped oversee uh, the state's response, working with the scientific community, Yale School of Management. Um, we could have had a couple more folks from uh, uh, public health. Uh, I think uh, you are at the right place at the right time, and uh, really um, happy that you're here and hope that some of you stick around. Um, uh, so to follow the science, of course, I needed Dr. Albert Koh and uh, Maritza to help uh, lead the way. And so I'll just start as a governor. Um, you know what you know, and you, you know what you don't know. And uh, I came into this job as the first business guy in um, you know, decades, and I come out of telecommunications. So if uh, you want to know what I was uh, thinking about in terms of um, you know, outside of jobs, the economy, and budget, uh, what was going to be the big iceberg, what we were really worried about, what could hit us. Um, probably, given my background, I was really worried about a, a cyber attack. And, uh, you know, we get pinged virtually every day, hundreds of times. And I saw, um, you know, municipalities and the such getting hit up, uh, you know, for ransomware and the such. And uh, so that's, that was the very first emergency test that we ran through our emergency operations center, which is uh, right next to the state capitol. And um, what was helpful about it was I also had to reach out to all my fellow governors, because uh, we realized that a lot of the threats, uh, be it um, rising tide, cyber, uh, germ, um, 
knew no borders. So I got to know, um, as part of that process, uh, Governor Cuomo, Governor Baker, New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. And that served us pretty well as we began hearing about um, uh, COVID, the virus. And then things happened really quickly. Um, you know, Josh and I were, you know, hearing a little bit about Wuhan and what was going on. We went uh, to the, um, I went to the Governor's Association meeting down in Washington, D.C. That was probably in late January, barely mentioned um, what was happening there. Uh, what we did have was the Secretary of Defense, Mike Pompeo, and he said, whatever you do, have nothing to do with the Chinese, because every time you get a gift from the Chinese, um, uh, it comes with strings attached, and I want to make sure. Uh, and I, I reference that because you'll see uh, what happened uh, soon thereafter. You know, from there, um, from there we saw what was going on in Wuhan, and then Seattle, and then New Rochelle. We were paying attention. Uh, the virus was getting closer. And then it was a, a Saturday night in early March that we got the call. Uh, a nurse at Danbury Hospital was the first Connecticut infection that we could identify. And uh, a shiver went up the spine. And all of a sudden, it wasn't overseas. It wasn't over there. It was right here. And there, all the training you've had, in our case, management, your case, public health, um, you got to reach out for the best and the brightest. Uh, first thing we had to do was within a week, we called the state of emergency that gave us a little more authority and power to make decisions quickly. Uh, I couldn't have the legislature in session because uh, it was um, obviously risky having 187 people under, under that dome. Uh, you know, within a week or so thereafter, we closed down um, high school basketball and schools. And then it really came home, uh, what was going on. And uh, it was in and around at that point that um, we began thinking about, look, I, I saw what was happening in Queens, not to mention um, other places where the hospitals were getting overwhelmed. So um, first thing Josh and I had to do when it comes to reaching out the experts, we reached out to the hospital community here uh, in the state of Connecticut. And to be uh, blunt, um, we had had, the state had had a lousy relationship with the hospitals. In fact, they were suing each other for the last 10 years. Fortunately, we had put that behind us, and when we reached out, we said, we need you. Uh, you maybe remember back then it was flatten the curve, make sure we don't have that surge that could overwhelm our ICUs, overwhelm our hospitals, like we saw in Italy, like we saw in Queens. And uh, I'm... Uh, we worked together really closely with Marna here at Yale New Haven, Hartford Hospital, um, Nuveen, and, and it made a difference. And all of a sudden, our hospitals were working together as one. And when Stanford Hospital was being overwhelmed and Greenwich Hospital was being overwhelmed, because the virus was marching like an army from uh, the greater New York metro area right up the uh, metro north corridor. And uh, Southern Fairfield County and Danbury were the first to get hit. And at that point, we had Hartford Health and others, you know, bringing down the troops, bringing down what spare masks we could find, what spare vents. We were all terrified about the shortage of vents at that time. We've learned a lot uh, since then. And nurses, to make sure we were never overwhelmed. And I can tell you that the uh, water crested. It got pretty close, <laughs> remember, pretty close to the top of the bathtub, but it never overflowed. And at that point, we're also thinking about um, what more can we do to flatten the curve? And that took us to uh, looking at the folks flying in from overseas. We had virtually no testing capacity at that time. You probably remember the CDC said, um, what few tests you do, send them down to Atlanta, and a week later, uh, you may get a response. And it was uh, longer than a week later. And then uh, soon thereafter, they said, uh, you can use your own uh, state lab, and our lab could do maybe 20 tests a day. So let's say we are really, um, uh, being tight about, you know, testing people who came in from Wuhan. Then as we expanded our um, mix a little bit more broadly, we were able to start testing people with symptoms or at least first responders with symptoms because we really had to make sure that um, 
uh, nurses could get back to the ICUs. Nurses would keep showing up at the uh, nursing homes where we needed help. Uh, food service workers and others who were just getting scared out of their minds. And uh, we could have had a total shutdown. And we had to do everything we could to give people confidence uh, going forward. And um, one of the things we needed to give people confidence was to um, bring in folks from business and uh, the healthcare community. Uh, I, I did my best to interpret what I was hearing from um, Indra and Albert, but uh, that's what we needed. And we had a David Shearer and a few folks, some spontaneous group of uh, healthcare professionals who were beginning to think about what we had to do. And uh, we brought them into the mix, and we had probably um, 20 leading healthcare professionals, uh, everything from Dr. Ko, an epidemiologist, to folks who focused on testing, who folks, uh, focused on therapies. Um, to start off. And uh, our job was to lead with the science, as uh, Justin said. And what I tried to do was explain what we were doing in layman's terms. Uh, yeah, I could not do this by fiat. I could not just order people, wear the mask and stay safe, stay home, or else I'm going to arrest you. I had to um, do the best I could to convince people that um, the very best minds we could lean on were strongly saying this is a life or death. And if you're talking to a young person who are maybe a little more casual and um, invincible, this is life or death for your parent or your grandparent who you're living with. And do the best we could um, to convince people this was the right thing to do. And uh, Connecticut um, was very responsive there early on. Uh, at the same time, we had to do, um, in terms of um, the mass, uh, we're all pretty socially distanced, so uh, the dean said I could take my mask off for just this brief um, moment. Um, there was no uh, supply down in Washington, D.C. You probably heard, don't worry, the cavalry's on the way. It's going to come up from um, you know, the supply depot in Washington. There was nothing there. And we went to our hospitals, first of all, and they had maybe a two-week supply of masks and gowns, and at that point, we were focused on vents. And, uh, at that point, you had 50 governors um, scrambling, doing the best we could to find where we could get, in particular, the masks, because uh, it was the potential that our economy and our society shut down if people did not feel safe. And if we couldn't get the masks, we, we couldn't uh, stem the tide. And uh, you know, Josh, fortunately, had, um, had some work in the scientific community, so we were able to locally uh, source a lot of the um, PPE that we needed. but. Uh, uh, that was not enough, and there was a scramble, and it was one state competing against each other, and we'd have this stuff ordered, and it'd be landing at the airport, and then like uh, uh, Zoom pricing on Uber, the plane would take off and go to a place where they had had a higher um, mm -hmm. offer for the same PP. And uh, at that point, um, I, I think back to Mike Pompeo, what he said about China in his dismissive way, and we, had to we realized that... Um, Connecticut and America don't have control over their own supply chain, especially when it comes to, uh, um, at that point it was PPE. Later on, we can talk about antibiotics or we can talk about other things where we need control. And um, there we, uh, we reached out to our friends in the business community and the political community and got some relationships with China and um, you know, chartered the plane. The plane was about to take off. China shuts down the border. Um, uh, finally, we got it to San Francisco. The trucks got lost on their way here to um, Connecticut. And finally, um, finally, at a nice day in late April, early May, we were all there with the uh, nurses and first responders cheering as the tractor trailer trucks uh, came in with um, uh, the PPE that we needed uh, to survive. Uh, at the same time, um, we wanted to think about what happens next. And that's when um, you know, my dear friend, Indra Nui, had, has been such a help to the state all along the way. She was helping with economic development, stepped up and said, um, I think I know some people. I think I can help us get restarted. And um, you may think, gosh, it was a little funny time to be thinking about restarting. Um, you know, we were, um, you know, we, we had the, the fatalities on a daily basis. I'd be uh, you know, doing the TV press conference every afternoon, and everybody was glued, wondering what was happening next. As we, But I, we were also thinking about um, what does happen next, and how we slowly get back to a new normal. 
And first we had to think about how we um, close things down. And uh, that was actually the, peop the, the folks at Connecticut were ready. They knew what we had to do. By the time I closed down the schools, 90% had already closed. By the time I uh, closed down um, stores and hair salons and restaurants, um, people were already voting with their feet and not wanting to show up. Um, it was a little tougher with bars, actually, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the bars were, were packed, St. Patrick's Day, and then it was the very next day that um, we had to uh, close those down. But soon thereafter, um, you know, with Indra and the team of um, small business people that she put together and folks from the association, we're also thinking about how you can open and open safely. And, uh, you know, there, um, you know, Albert, Indra, and I would have some, you know, real debates because shut it down, stay closed, let's wait until we're 100% safe, let's wait until we have a vaccine, you know, only then can you open, but you, people were getting a little frisky, and it was spring, and they'd been locked up for an awful long time, and um, so we had to give people a sense of direction uh, that we were on the way, um, there was a way out of here, and uh, that's why on May 20th was the first time that Albert, you know, said, look, you're, they're bringing the infection rate down, we flattened the curve, I think you can begin to do, you can begin to slowly reopen some things. So we did some of the stores uh, and outdoor dining just to get a small sense of normalcy back to what we were trying to accomplish. And uh, the good news is that I think uh, our reopen committee, we did it right and people believe that they were doing it right. So they were voluntarily following all the guidance and protocols that we had put in place and ever since that uh, May 20th day when we started reopening, our infection rate as a state has been going down uh, virtually um, every week thereafter. And as uh, you know, Peter said, we're fortunately one of the very few states that um, have an infection rate in and around 1% uh, that has been over the last uh, you know, 90 days. Uh, you know, that said, um, that's when people start getting casual. And that's when we started worrying. And that's when I saw, um, they reopened too soon in places like Texas and Florida and Arizona. And uh, you, all of a sudden you saw a hockey stick and it ramp up. So you had to balance the good news going on in Connecticut with the risks that you saw elsewhere and do as best we can to explain that to people in a way that they could understand so they would voluntarily follow the protocols. So they would wear the mask even though they didn't necessarily think they had to. And uh, there I gotta tell you, um, uh, Connecticut's been a leader. I mean, we're more likely to wear the mask in just about any mm -hmm. state in the uh, country. And um, that's made an enormous difference. And we put in place an advertising campaign. Um, um, and just friends from uh, Omnicom helped us with that. And I was getting, you know, do I have to wear the mask uh, outdoors if I'm not within five feet of people? What if I'm in a screened in porch? Uh, what happens if I'm inside but I'm just with my closest friends? And we came up with a motto, if you have to ask, wear the mask. <laughs> And, uh, and that resonated and made a difference. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with um, you know, one last thought, which is uh, you're all here at the School of Public Health and this may be uh, your opening week. And um, I didn't really understand public health the way I should have a year and a half ago when I took office. And I think I told you what were the risks I was focusing on given my background. And uh, thankfully, um, there are a lot of folks smarter than me in our state government, and uh, we have Deirdre Gifford who came out of HHS, and we had Matt Carter who's affiliated here in our Department of Public Health working to catch up. And then state government can't do it all, working with the scientific community, working with Albert Coe, working with Jackson Labs, working with UConn Health, uh, we were able to do this. But I would urge each and every one of you, um, if you're thinking about what you wanna do along the way, um, we got internship programs for you at the Department of Public Health and a career thereafter, because this is the beginning of something, not the mm -hmm. end of something, and we need you more than ever. Thank you, Governor Lamont. Uh, that was a terrific review of where we've been. Um, many of us in the audience uh, went with you on this journey. Uh, um, I think uh, our Dean of our School of Medicine, Nancy Brown, who's here in the front row, um, had been on the job for um, four weeks. Uh, she started the 1st of February. Uh, uh, Ann Kurth took responsibility, dean of our School of Nursing, took responsibility for a lot of the PPE crisis uh, here on campus. So 
uh, we, we, we took a role in, in contact tracing the School of Public Health. So we've been with you from the start of this, and uh, uh, we're very proud of our School of Public Health students um, who were quickly joined by a School of Medicine, a School of Nursing students who served as a 200-person uh, volunteer uh, group doing contact tracing for the city of New Haven. So on that note, uh, you've already answered the first question that's being posed to you, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to evolve that. Many of us thought that your regional approach, where you and your fellow governors from Delaware to Massachusetts um, sort of started to own that I-95 Amtrak corridor and tried to synergize your responses. Could you comment just a little further on that? You mentioned it, but I'd love to hear how that came about. Uh, two things I'd say. One, um, it was no help what was coming out of uh, Washington, D.C. and the White House and Clorox and masks for wimps and a lot of missed signals. And uh, so we as fellow governors said we have a pretty good bully pulpit. but we wanted to speak with one voice in terms of what you have to do from a point, public health point of view. And Dean, um, also we realized, I realized as a relatively small state next to Massachusetts and uh, New York, that um, I can close my bars, but that doesn't make any difference if Cuomo and Baker leave their bars open, you got people driving back and forth, that's even a lot more dangerous. So what we tried to do when it came to closing down was speak with one voice that allowed us to better explain to people what we are trying to do and kept people closer to home. Excellent. And along with your chief of staff, the two representatives to that multi-state task force were in fact our Reopen Connecticut co-chairs, uh, Albert Cohen and Indra Nuri, who are with us today. And I wanted to ask, how did the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Group approach its mission? There you were given the, you were given the, the mandate by the governor. How did you organize yourselves and think about this in the kind of strategic response that, uh, that you uh, embraced and came out in your report? So when um, the governor called me, I think on a Saturday, and said, I want you to co-chair this with Albert Co. I'd only seen Albert on Zoom. I'd never met him, really didn't know him. So I came up on Sunday morning to the Yale School of Medicine, and Albert taught me the basics of public health and epidemiology. It was like a multi-hour lecture, because <laughs> you can't really co-chair something with an epidemiologist and make decisions or recommend decisions for the state without understanding a little bit of the science and the epidemiology. So it was very, very important, that first meeting that Albert and I had. And very soon we realized that the shutdown was a suppression of the virus. And the longer you suppress, the harder it was going to be to come out of suppression. Because had we stayed suppressed for a year, economic activity would have struggled massively, and we wouldn't know how to come out of the shutdown. So there was a critical uh, intermediate point where we had to dial between public health and economic health. And when we decided that we have to prioritize economic health in some times and public health in other times, we also had to make sure that anything we opened had the appropriate safety protocols. So the big discussion that Albert and I were leading with the team, we recruited the best and the brightest of scientists, business people. It was amazing how many people volunteered to be on this reopen committee, quit their jobs temporarily to work on this committee. And I think we worked um, you know, 18 hours a day for about six to eight weeks. But everybody worked as a team, and we worked with Josh and Dave Lehman and the governor. Um, and what was amazing is they understood the science, and it was a wonderful partnership where we all worked together to decide how best to dial these two public health and economic health of the state and get to the right point where you stay suppressed for a while and slowly you start to open up the right protocols so you don't have another outbreak. That was a dance that was most difficult to execute. So we went sector by sector, put in protocols for opening and then for slowly ramping up. And I think that's what served us in good stead. The fact that we could recommend something with a clear mind, objective, and then the state took our recommendations and modified it for the state because what we did did not really look at the realities on the ground in the state. So the state then took it up and said, this is what we think makes sense, this doesn't make sense, let's modify it. So it was a wonderful partnership between 
the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Group, and the state. I don't know, Albert, what you want to add, because Albert really was the uh, star of the whole Reopen Connecticut, because without Albert's input, I don't think we could have had a Reopen Connecticut task force. So, Albert? I, don't know. I, I really don't have much to add. I think that captured the, the, the vision and the mission of the Reopen Connecticut. And of course, this was, this was um, uh, calibrated together with you know, people from the governor's office, the governor himself, Josh, you know, Josh Javal, David Lehman. I think the couple things that came out of this that was, just to add, was that um, you know, what made this different from other states was, first of all, it was done early. I think we were, we were ahead of the curve in terms of other states. And, and what the governor said, thinking about how you're going to reopen. You know, we were at the peak of the epidemic, but thinking proactively. Uh, the second thing was that it was multidisciplinary. Um, you know, Indra, with her vision, brought in not only the public health and the, uh, the business and the economy, but also the education and the social, you know, the societal, the sports, the education, the um, uh, the social services all together until one, one um, part. So it was this, I think it got at this idea of well-being rather than public health. And what differentiated, I think, Connecticut was that we put well-being ahead, whereas other states just led with either public health or they led with one of the sectors like, like business. And I think that's how we got that, that special formula. And I think that we're a tiny state, as, as the governor said, but when we first started, we were looking at other states to see how well they were doing their reopen plans because every state was setting up a reopen committee. But as we reached about the five or six week mark, most states were calling us to say, what's Connecticut doing? Because we like your approach. So clearly, uh, the expert team we assembled together was doing a very good job in thinking through the reopen. And when the protocols were published on how to reopen the state, some of the states that I was looking up to, like Utah, were calling and saying, can we borrow Connecticut's protocols? You guys have the best protocols for opening schools or colleges or restaurants or whatever. I said, look, it's all on ct.gov. You can have it all. It's really for humanity, mm -hmm. not necessarily for Connecticut. So I think that this partnership between the uh, reopened Connecticut team and the governor's office really worked well. You know, I read the book, The Great Influenza by John Barry. The last chapter of that book was profound. It really talked about what needed to happen. It talked about a leader should be driven by science but applied judgment. They should speak to the media honestly without creating panic. They should make sure that they understand the economic side and the health side. Everything I read about in that last chapter of the book, I think Connecticut practiced. If you watch the governor's press conferences, they were honest fact-based, science-based, but they didn't create panic. So uh, I think we were, in many cases, thanks to you, Governor, a bit of a textbook on how we might want to approach. I hope we never have another pandemic, but we could mm. write a playbook for ourselves. So thank you. Excellent. And what a great transition to uh, Director Maritza Bond, head of our health department right here in our city of New Haven. Um, you know that there have been overwhelming challenges well documented within the health sector. What uh, uh, Dean Brown and her counterpart, Dean Liang up at UConn faced with Marna Borgstrom and her counterparts uh, leading uh, the health systems and hospitals and clinics of the, the state um, are, are really, um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a terrible story. At the same time, uh, the health system rose to the occasion, managed to get the PPE, managed to care for the patients, managed to do their very best to keep the death rates to a minimum. Um, but what about the public health system? What challenges you faced are not as well documented, not as widely appreciated. What were the greatest challenges in the city of New Haven uh, in your role as uh, the new director of the Department of Health? And you just walked in as the mayor did, and were hit by this. What were some of your principal challenges in the months of uh, March and April? Yeah, so, you know, as you mentioned, I was uh, the new appointed health director. Uh, my official first day was the 27th of January. <laughs> and I get a call from the mayor on the 26th about a presumptive um, potential case of a symptomatic individual that was visiting from overseas and needed to be isolated um, and then tested. 
So that was my first day. So my first day has been for the last seven months to really respond to, to COVID. And, you know, as a public health practitioner, not being new to public health, but being um, back in the city that even inspired me to be in, um, in this sector, um, we have not seen this form of pandemic in over 100 years, right? Mm -hmm. So as public health practitioners, we know it in theory, we want to prepare and activate, and the reality is that our public health infrastructure has been dismantled over the last few decades, um, that we needed to figure out an infrastructure relatively quickly. Um, and one of the things that um, you know, the, the mayor um, did as a collective is that we wanted to activate a unified command approach. Um, this needed to be a team effort with multi-sectors involved and different lens um, that included not just the government partners but external partners and realizing that that was going to be the great, the best way to try to box in this pandemic. And so it really consisted of, you know, I, I, I love every point that was shared earlier, you know, the mayor shared earlier about addressing inequities and seeing how this pandemic early on um, starting exacerbating the inequities of specific subgroups and how do we then create public health interventions for those groups? How are we gonna be transparent and be uh, forthcoming with the information? And early on, not only was the governor um, sharing their weekly updates, but we wanted at the local level be very specific and transparent. So the mayor was wanted, we did a daily presser and we wanted to provide daily updates to our local community on what we're doing, what our cases look like in our city, and what interventions are in place and available. That was really important, and I loved the governor's comment about there is no borders, and we were very conscious of that, like what's happening, what are other cities doing, and so not only did the mayor communicate with other local mayors, we were communicating with other local health directors on sharing resources, because we really needed to maximize the existing resources and build an infrastructure that was gonna be sustainable. Well, that's terrific to hear about the regionalization, even at the city level, you were thinking about the region and communicating uh, with a central command. So that was terrific. Uh, so good opportunity to turn it over to the mayor. Um, you, of course, have been in the office for a couple months <laughs> when this hit. Uh, seems to be a recurring theme here. <laughs> and uh, you've been credited for making some very firm and tough decisions early in the pandemic response, communicating them very clearly and very honestly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how people in the audience feel, but I was very impressed with your response. Um, however, uh, in a leadership position like yours, with the benefit of hindsight, you're bound to have one or two or three things that you might have done differently. And we would love to hear from you sort of thinking about what, what, what lessons learned, what might you have done even more effectively in the month of, say, uh, February, March, uh, to, to stem the disaster of April? Um, I would have hired Director Vaughn earlier. <laughs> <laughs> For starters, uh, she started working the day before she started working, which is, uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> And I, and I have to admit, and I'm sure many people have thought about, if only we knew, um, I think from time to time I should have ordered 10,000 N95 masks in January, right? I'm sure our procurement team would be like, why are you doing that? But now that we know, um, there's a lot of things that we would have done uh, differently. Uh, do you remember when we um, started wearing masks and we're talking about how masks don't protect you, they protect other people? And now there's a lot of evidence that says that they protect you as well. Um, those are things that I think we all experience together. I, I think that um, we will be uh, uh, thinking for uh, many years to come of, of could we have saved lives by doing uh, certain things differently that, um, that we should have known to do differently. And, um, and I know Director Bond and I have talked a lot about this, and I think one area that um, we might have uh, approached a little bit differently is nursing homes. Uh, and, and again, it's hard in hindsight to, um, or it's easy in hindsight to uh, say we would have done some, th some things differently, but uh, we lost a lot of people in nursing homes. And uh, you know, I, I visit a number of the nursing homes on a regular basis. And every time I go, it, it, it's very emotional because of, um, uh, 
you know, the re residents uh, holding signs for events saying I'm a survivor and you implicitly know that so many of their, uh, uh, their um, neighbors did not survive. And, uh, and, and I think that there are things that we could have uh, potentially done to help protect those individuals more. Again, it's in hindsight, but um, I think that you know, these types of decisions will weigh on many of us for, uh, for a long time. Thank you. Um, you're absolutely right. That was an immense challenge, and I believe the, the latest statistic is that 60, 63 percent of all the deaths in the state were mm -hmm. attributable to folks in, in nursing homes and assisted living. Um, we're back to the governor. Uh, you had your break, governor. Now we're putting you on the spot. Connecticut hosts 169 discrete municipalities. And assuming that this level of decentralization is challenging for effective pandemic control, how have you and the state worked efficiently with this number of towns and cities in lieu of what is a more traditional kind of state structure working with a larger county structure? Well, I'll tell you, first off, um, New Haven was a star performer. Uh, New Haven was a star performer in terms of um, just the percentage of people that got tested and how important that was. Mm -hmm. and, and you may think, eh, it's just a matter of having more mobile vans and more people get tested or making it free or more people get tested. But you really have to explain every day how important. I mean, we would go to um, you know, AME African-American churches where folks are a little less likely to want to get tested. You get tested, you um, lose your job, or you have to sit out for two weeks, what happens? And, and um, you know, Justin, Director Bond did just a heck of a job of convincing people the importance, what it means to your family, what it means to your community. But you're right, Dean. I mean, we got 169 towns, and uh, it's the most incredibly inefficient uh, structure. And yet uh, Connecticut is proud of its feisty independence. Um, you know, we're trying to um, manage the track and trace through a, a public health departments. It's working really well in New Haven. You've been a leader there. Um, and it's obviously a lot of the smaller towns, they need more guidance, they need more coaching, and sometimes they need more, um, you know, expertise there to make it happen. We don't have a county form of government, so it, it'd be easier to manage on a top-down basis. But I think given the urgency that people felt and uh, Josh's leadership, um, even the track and trace, which is primarily being done on that local basis, is being done effectively. And when you have a 1% infection rate, it's a little easier to track and trace everybody, too. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thanks. Uh, let's turn it back to uh, our co-chairs, Indra and Albert. Um, there is a question that came in from the audience that I thought I would throw in your direction. Um, some models are suggesting that there could very well be a surge of cases uh, as early as November, but possibly in the traditional uh, viral respiratory season of December through, through March. And none of us know if that's going to happen, and much of it's behavioral mediated. It may be that people in Connecticut are more efficient at controlling, and it won't happen. But let's just say that we start to see a surge this winter. How might the response differ from what our experience was in March and April? OK, so, so I think a, a couple caveats to that question. Uh, so as we're seeing in Spain, Italy, France right now, you don't need to invoke a winter season you know, to have, have a significant uh, surge. And so the, the, the risk of a surge is, is with us, irrespective, I think, of a season. Now, we're co particularly concerned about what's going to happen in the winter season. You know, the, the outdoor restaurants are going to close. We're going to have um, people more standing, uh, spending more time indoors. There's going to be higher contact rates inside uh, closed, uh, closed encounters. And then we also have the specter of influenza. We already have, you know, influenza seasonal influenza peaks that take, put our healthcare systems into surge crisis uh, quite, quite often. So, so I think the touch points or the pressure points coming up into the winter season are increased contact rates. We're reopening our schools. The second would be the cold, cold weather, people having more contact. So what are we, 
what we were going to do differently. And, and let, let me just say, that I think there are two heroes in this story. The first heroes are, are the, I think, the governor's team, the office, the people in the Department of Public Health. Many of these people are, are alumni from the Yale School of Public Health. I'm thinking about Kristen Soto, who stood up the, the contact tracing program, thinking about people like uh, Matt Carter, who's, uh, who's a faculty in our Department of Epidemiology and Mi uh, Microbial Diseases. Deidre Gifford, who, um, you know, I think one of the unfortunate things we have really, you know, thing we have um, things that really open our hearts to what, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of the responses. We've also seen things like last weekend where, where our Commissioner of Health, you know, received threats because of, um, of uh, I think, sound evidence-based decisions about, you know, stopping, stopping football. But getting back on track, I think the, you know, those, those, are, those are one set of heroes and they're doing their job. And I think they've, they've actually, the governor's office, and I'd uh, include Josh Javel and, uh, and Michelle Gilman, who are really implementing you know, sound policies. They're getting us ahead of the curve. And proactively, whether it's immunizations for influenza, whether it's getting up testing capacity, uh, maximizing the opportunity to contain. So that's very different from the situation we were you know, back, back, in, back in March. I think the second thing is that, in which I, 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 I thought was remarkable, and, and probably the unsung heroes are the citizens of, uh, of Connecticut. You know, they're wearing the fast face masks, they're socially distancing. We see these metrics, whether it's, you know, you know through, through different you know, contact, phone, contact rates between cell phones. The citizens of, of, of Connecticut really have taken social distancing and all the public health prevention to heart. And, and I'm not sure we really understand why that is and why you know, Connecticut is different from Georgia or Florida or even, even Delaware or Pen Pennsylvania. But I think we're, that is certainly different from when we were, we were before you know, at the, in March or February you know, at the, at the start, start of the epidemic. So I think with sound policies, evidence-driven policies, policies which go beyond what is you know, expected you know, from the CDC or from the federal government. But I think that's been, the, that's been what we've seen in, in Connecticut. Together with really the buy-in from the population, I think we're gonna, you know, the, the aspiration for us is through that winter season to, to be in containment mode, you know, uh, rather than having to be, um, you know, in a reactive mode to resurgence. You know, Albert and I were teaching a class at SOM last weekend and uh, a class with health, healthcare professionals. And there was a student, a practicing student from uh, San Antonio, Texas. And he was the first guy to ask questions. And he said, we are struggling in San Antonio. We all looked to Connecticut to see how well you guys did the reopen. That was a big compliment. And so he said he's brought his wife and daughter to show them Connecticut because the state is doing so well. I think uh, it's a good story overall. Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Director Bond. Um, you know, in con you mentioned that the infrastructure um, uh, for public health in the state has not kept up with need. And there was, a, there was an immediate uh, demand, both at the state level and at the local health department level, to um, recreate structures that may have been in place 30 years ago, but were not in place at the present time. One of those is contact tracing. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on your partnership, uh, the partnerships in April that you used for immediate response, and what you with the state have done uh, now in September? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So one of, you know, as mentioned, we had to really talk about how we're gonna box in this, this pandemic. So now that we had this, you know, we were doing testing, we were isolating, quarantining individuals, the way that works is utilizing a contact tracing model. And we didn't have a system in place when we started the contact tracing. So it was more informal in realizing we had public health nursing, nurses, our epidemiologists, we knew that the cases were greater than the staffing structure that we had. Mm -hmm. And so we created a partnership with um, the Yale School of Public Health where we then created a infrastructure and expanded um, upon what we were doing. And it was, it, was, it was such a great success because it allowed us to be able to then engage public health students, 
medical students, nursing students, to then take theory that they're learning in, in their coursework and then apply it to a live pandemic and be able to support um, our, our contact tracing efforts. And it was so instrumental um, in being able to mitigate um, the pandemic in our city. And you know, fast forward, um, what did that do? We, you know, the state rolled out a contact tracing uh, model across the state. And so what we wanted to do at the local level is be complementary to what was being um, rolled out at the state level because we wanted to make sure that everything was consistent and standardized. Um, that is the only way we are going to be able to successfully um, do that. And so we um, then pretty much transition into the state model where we're now um, having a, a couple of ways that we are addressing it. We are still using uh, volunteers, but Medical Reserve Corps and staff still to roll it out across the state. So it's been really successful. Um, and, and you know, initially realizing that we needed to have this infrastructure that was going to um, be able to address an immediate need, but then recognizing the importance of standardization um, to, to be consistent with other um, local health and state um, health department efforts. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna get a little parochial now with the mayor. How does the city view Yale's reopening? Because here Yale University uh, is in the heart of downtown New Haven, bringing students from I don't know how many states, let's just say 45 states and 45 countries, uh, all back uh, you know, in, 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 in the month of August, early September, how do you see Yale and its uh, response and the way it's a reopening? I, I, I just wanted to first make a quick comment on um, uh, the contact tracing because it was so vital, uh, our partnership in particular with the School of Public Health, uh, to uh, being quite successful at identifying cases and ensuring there wasn't additional spread. And it got a lot of attention, and it's, it's funny, uh, our communications person said, oh, the, the, the BBC's reached out to, uh, uh, to talk to the city. And I said, oh, that's great. I've never been interviewed by BBC before. And, and our communication person said, no, actually, they want to talk to Director Bond. <laughs> and there was consistently things like that because uh, the support and the relationship that we had with the School of Public Health, uh, on, in particular on that contract tracing program, was something that was hugely helpful in New Haven, but also was something that um, my hope is, because we got a lot of attention and press on this, that many other communities were able to benefit from that model as well. On your specific point about reopening, uh, it, it, we've been uh, very um, happy with the approach that the university um, has taken as, uh, to reopening. Uh, Peter and I had conversations about the importance of reopening because of uh, what you both talked about of well-being and not just uh, using that, uh, keeping every person healthy from COVID mm -hmm. perspective, because there's so many other reasons that we need to keep our overall society healthy mm -hmm. that lead to other health impacts. If people don't have jobs, if they don't have homes, if they don't have a steady income, there's all kinds of additional health impacts. And thinking about this pandemic from a wider angle, uh, about the economic impacts and what they can do to the health of our community is something that I think is vital to our success. And the university, um, I think, understood the importance of opening up in a cautious and very thoughtful way, mm. but they understood the importance of it. And that's everything from uh, mm. the quarantine period that uh, you've instigated, the very, very robust uh, testing regime, uh, the uh, very serious, um, uh, the, the, the students in the university taking very, very seriously, not having parties, not congregating. We've seen what happens when that doesn't mm -hmm. take place in other universities and how that impacts not just the students, but the community at large. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've been very grateful that the university has been willing to open because New Haven's economy is deeply reliant on the, uh, the university and people physically being here, but doing it in a way that um, up till now has uh, kept us very, very safe, and the cases have been very, very low. Uh, and, and so I, I just want to underscore, when you think about it, there's so many stories of other universities, we've been very happy with how things have been going. Did you hear that, Peter? Some good news for Yale for a change. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank, thank you, Mayor. Actually, we really appreciate 
partnership and, and trying to do the right thing for campus and for our surrounding community. Appreciate your support and partnership in all of this. Absolutely. Well, I can't believe that our time is coming to a close uh, because I have a, more than a dozen uh, questions from the audience that we're not going to get to. So uh, I apologize to everybody who won't get their question answered. But I'm going to end with the governor, and I'll end with a, a clustering of a few of those questions. So one questioner asked, where is the federal COVID relief money for local health departments? And another questioner asked, when will um, Connecticut uh, really highlight the critical role of local health departments and provide more um, funding and more consistent funding commensurate with their responsibilities? And another uh, questioner asks, um, what will there, this new national dialogue on the dangers of continuing to underfund public health in our country, when will, how will that translate at the state and local level um, and they, the, the questioner ends with a commentary, local public health officials and workers on the front lines need our support, protection, and advocacy. So throw that to you, sir. Well, we got our COVID relief money, and uh, I think more than any other state, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, we've allocated a higher percentage of it to testing than anybody else, working closely with our uh, local departments of public health. You have been right on the front lines of this, and. And if, uh, as I suggested early on, I have an absolute new appreciation for how important what each and every one of you are going to be doing in our local departments of public health. And I just want you to remember one thing, because I have to remind everybody all the time, probably you less so, we're not out of the woods yet. And uh, as you heard you know, Dr. Coe say, um, you want to know what I've been worried about? I mean, I think K through 8, I think we can do that. That's a narrow cohort. Uh, Peter. I'm obviously a little more worried about colleges. Like the dean said, we're coming from all over the region, higher infection areas. Yale and our colleges have done it really well. A guy named Rick Levin, maybe you heard of him, you know, helped put together our college committee. Um, and we've been testing very thoughtfully on that. Uh, as people start going inside, like Dr. Coe said, I think November will be a, a period of risk. So my job is to make sure that we keep our discipline, something Connecticut has uh, really led the country in and make sure we realize that this is really a very crucial um, you know, 60, 90 days coming up. And, um, and, and that's something, an urgency I have to repeat. And, uh, but more specifically to your question, I have a new fond appreciation of each and every one of you, what you do, how important you are going forward. I'm afraid this is not um, a 10 year or 100 year phenomenon. It's gonna be more frequent than that. We gotta be ready. And a public health and public safety are side by side as our top priorities. Thank you to you, Governor, to you, Mayor, to our uh, uh, heroes of the uh, Reopen Connecticut uh, uh, Advisory Group, uh, to our local hero, uh, Director Bond. Thank you to all of you. Appreciate Deans uh, Brown and Kurth joining us, Josh Shabal uh, from the state. Uh, but most importantly, our School of Public Health students. This was an event that was conceptualized by Albert and the governor on your behalf to recognize you and your uh, uh, future contributions to this discipline. Thank you, Peter, and uh, I bid you a good day. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>